for his great deeds, he will be greatly missed. We said he should rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Leader for Position. Uh, the third second is not visible, so we'll just go straight to the contributions. Uh, there are so many, um, but we just need three minutes each. I'll try and catch everybody. Let's start with the uh, Bahati. Let's take those first. Then I'll get some back benches, then come to the side. Three minutes, please. Thank you so much. Madam Speaker, and I thank you, Madam Speaker, for personally turning up at Kololo to join the rest of the mourners in mourning for our beloved uh, late Archbishop. And I remember vividly just a few years ago when His Grace the Archbishop came here to honor the Ash Wednesday as the chief celebrant. When I sent you a message uh, when you were chairing the session, you immediately said you are joining the house to give way for the Archbishop who had arrived and the Catholic family of the house to go and honor the Arch Wednesday. So I realized that you pay a lot of attention and you give due respect to the religious leaders in this country. Thank you. Right, Honorable Speaker, we have three types of Archbishops. We have the titular Archbishop, and this is an honorary title granted to someone by the Holy Pontiff in recognition of their services to the church. The second one is the official Archbishop, and this is given by, this is the, the given title by virtue of the office of hold, one holds. For example, a Pope Nuncio is an Archbishop by virtue of that office. The third one is the Metropolitan Archbishop. According to the Canon Law 435, the Metropolitan Archbishop is the Archbishop of his diocese and is appointed by the Roman Pontiff and presides over the, ex the, the province, for example, Kampala Archdiocese. The Metropolitan Archdiocese has four independent, but dioceses in their independence with their own bishops. So, the late Archbishop, Dr. Chizitolwanga, belonged to the third category. And the Archbishop, Dr. Cyprian Chizitolwanga, has fulfilled up to the last day of his life his ecumenical calling as the Archbishop in that category. He has been tireless in organizing seminars, monthly and annual retreats for his priests, and was available 24 hours to attend to their needs and even on phone and late in the night. He has also taken care of that province and he has made for the priests decent support and social assistance according to the norm of the law. He has built decent priest houses and convenants in almost all parishes and intended and initiated a priest's provident fund to support their retirement package. Right Honorable Speaker, as much as possible, a diocesan bishop is to foster vocations in different ministries. The Archbishop supported seminarians, both minor and major. He has equipped and developed seminaries like Nswanjele, Chisubi, Msentimbaga. He has done all that in the short time that he has been with us. The Archbishop really lived like a candle in the wind. He was an elegant, powerful preacher of the Word of God, and also he could talk to the very minor people in this country with a view of seeking their opinion as if they knew much more than he did. But I think all this was done for him to have a legacy and show people that it is the lower people that matter more than even the higher ones. Right Honorable Speaker, through this house, I would request that we remember that the, 20, the matters that we have in Uganda were mainly accorded so because of healing the sick. The Archbishop has healed and alleviated people from poverty, especially the Catholics. I would pray that his life and legacy can be researched on with a view of becoming a martyr in Uganda. May his soul rest in eternal peace. 
Thank you very much, Madam Mwingo, the Honorable Anwar, the Honorable Hachi. I've seen you. Thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker and dear colleagues, I stand here to support the motion, pay tribute to our dear friend, the late Archbishop Dr. Supriyan Kistorwanga. Right Honorable Speaker, the cruel hand of death has robbed this country of a great man a great pastor, a great teacher, a parent to many of us, right honorable speaker. Right honorable speaker, the Archbishop of Kampala, the late Dr. Supriyan Kistolwanga, preached peace, preached justice, preached welfare and human rights, welfare of individuals. He wanted to see everybody happily enjoying his or her stay in this country. As you are all aware, the Archbishop rose from a very humble background in, in Mukono, a place called Chabakade. Very little was known about that place until the Archbishop was born. Very remote very quiet place in Nimkono district. People there today, we can say he has transformed that rural area and we are very proud of it. Many of us, right honorable speaker, are beneficiaries of the efforts of this great man of God. Yet the Archbishop has made us through his wise counsel through his guidance, through his mentorship, has made many of us into what we are. Archbishop has been a friend to the poor, to the sick, to the elderly. He preached and his message reached almost everybody who needed support. He was preaching good Samaritanism. He always urged us, his Christians, to try to help those who need help, those who are poor, those who are rich was always encouraging us to share. This Archbishop loved his country, loved his church. Whenever I think about his legacy, two things come to my mind, right honorable speaker. One, he is a man who loved his church, who the man who loved his church and was a very firm defender of his, the, the Catholic Church doctrine, but he believed in ecumenism. He believed in an interreligious harmony, and he really lived it. And this is a gentleman who really respected all faith. He respected all religions. You would find him interacting with Muslims, interacting with other faith with a lot of respect. We thank God who has blessed this country, who blessed this country with a gift of a very brilliant man of God in the name of Dr. Suprian Kizitoruanga. May his soul rest in time of peace. Thank I you very submit. much. Dr. Banyua, Dr. Bahati, the Honorable was there. Noah Wanzala, actually that we are <laughs> Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. I stand up here to second the motion. On behalf of the people of Kitgo Municipality, I bring my condolences to the family of the late Archbishop, Dr. His Grace Dr. Ruanga, and uh, the Christian community. Madam Speaker, I want to thank you too for enabling us today in the People's Parliament to talk about this son of the soil 
whom we all fondly remember. Madam Speaker, the late Archbishop, His Grace Dr. Cyprian Duanga, is one of the few that God has sent probably to live as an example for us. One, it has all been said, he's a shepherd who looked after his sheep holistically, spiritually, and physically. He's remembered for his spiritual inspiration. He's remembered for trying to make the welfare of his sheep. And this one has made us feel proud. He understands those he led in totality. I want to thank His Excellency the President of the Republic of Uganda for according such, such a great son of the soil, a befitting send off. The fact is that, colleagues, we are here on a journey. We are not permanent. Every day we are walking towards the journey God has ordained. The time we do not know. We are here with a family, with a community who are so close. We are here to give hope, not to break them further. Because we are believers. As Christians, we do believe nothing happens without God's ordained time. The time was that. Let's respect that. It also, Madam Speaker, brings me to remember when we were celebrating the Uganda Matters Day two years ago, and uh, I happened to be one of those who read the reading in Uganda. And after that, he called and asked, how comes you know Uganda more than the original Ugandans here. I said, I'm one of them, and I'm a Ugandan. But that simplicity touched me, because he could even go into details, and even reach out to everybody. I'm so fond of that day. It made me feel good and proud. And today, I'm happy to talk in this parliament to say this is a testimony of a good shepherd of the Christian. But lastly, Madam Speaker and colleagues, when such an event happens, we talk, but we forget something. What does it teach us, you and me, that the time we do not know, we do not know the hour, how ready are we? You and me, how ready are we? You and me, how many will be able to be fondly remembered as the late Archbishop. Can we work towards making the world a better place, a memorable place when we live? Can we work towards, as Christians, as believers, to know that you need to leave a positive footstep so that the world remembers you? May his soul rest eternal peace. Thank you, Honobati. Bati then with the Bwanzara, Achon, Biandara, Kibaria, Sengo, Abala, then I come to the rest. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen it. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I rise to support the motion moved by the Prime Minister in paying tribute to our dear Archbishop Gwanga. I want, on behalf of the people of Ndogo West, on my, behalf of my family and the people of Kabale, send our condolences to the family, uh, to the diocese, of, uh, to, the to, the, to, the, to the entire Catholic community in Uganda on the passing of our dear uh, Archbishop.
Emba, Archbishop Gwanga, and one of them that I remember vividly is that Archbishop promoted a communical approach to evangelism. He believed in peace, harmony, reconciliation, and promoted development activities, education, and as the, as the Prime Minister said, the circle that he had started, which helped a number of, of, of people. He was one of the towering spiritual figures of our time, whose service and leadership earned him a title of God's ambassador and touched countless hearts and minds. I have worked with him closely when we are organizing the National Day of Prayer, normally in December, and I've seen how he works, how he leads people, and truly I was touched, and all of us were saddened by his death at a, a very early age. When we moved down to homosexuality bill in 2009, Madam Speaker, you recall, we interacted as a member. And in that meeting, one of the meetings I attended to explain to religious leaders, you know they have so many versions and uh, so many ideas. Some people were saying we should maybe approach them by caring for them, loving them, educating them, rather than moving the law. But in one of those meetings, Archbishop Gwanga vividly asked his uh, colleagues, religious leaders, he said, but what does the Bible say about that issue? And from that meeting, we were able to ignite unity around this issue. All the religious leaders spoke with one voice against homosexuality and the promotion of homosexuality in this country. So we want to thank him, we want to thank the Catholic Church that has looked after him, we want to thank you for standing with his family in these difficult days, and Madam Speaker, we thank you for allowing us this opportunity to pay tribute to the God servant who served this country for a long time and who earns this tribute that we are paying him. May God bless his soul. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable Anthera. Could the members of name move uh, nearer to the podium so we don't take time? Achon? No, Achon. Honorable Biandara. Kibaria. Sengo. Let's start with those. Well, but did I have seen you? I'm going to call you. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I stand also to second the motion raised by the Right, Pri right Honorable Prime Minister to pay tribute to Dr. Spirian Chistoruanga, the former Archbishop of Kampala Archdiocese. Madam Speaker, Dr. Spirian Chistoruanga will be remembered for his spiritual development, will be remembered for his missionary work, will be remembered for his infrastructure development. Madam Speaker, I heard very clearly the Prime Minister mentioning that Dr. Spiriani Chisturuanga was the pioneer bishop for Ruero Kasana Diocese. Madam Speaker, when you talk about Kasana Ruero Diocese, you mean Ruero Political District, you mean Nakasongola District, you mean Nakaseke District. So he was our pioneer bishop of Kasana Ruero Diocese. Madam Speaker, people of Ruero, Nakasongola, and Nakaseke will remember Dr. Spirian Kizito Ruanga for enlarging the cathedral of Kasana Ruero Diocese headquarters, which was not enough for Christians by that time. Madam Speaker, Dr. Spirian Kizito Ruanga will also be remembered for constructing the perimeter wall around the diocese. Madam Speaker, Dr. Spirian Kizito Wanga will be remembered for constructing the multipurpose hall or the multipurpose building which is 
helping the diocese to raise funds to run the diocese. Madam Speaker, Dr. Rwanga had unfinished business with Kasana Luero Diocese. When I was interacting with the Reverend Fathers and the Bishop of Kasana Luero, Bishop Semo Gerere, he had a plan of uh, constructing a flyover near the church to avoid the accidents which always occur on Kampala Guru Highway Road. He had that plan and of course UNRWA didn't take it. Uh, but of course I want to appeal to Parliament of Uganda and UNRWA and the Minister of Works to take his plan ahead and uh, a flyover be constructed. Madam Speaker, also a number of accidents are happening on Guru Highway Road around uh, the places of Wolverine, the places of uh, Kas Kasanaruero, uh, Mijera, Kakoge and Chankonwa, which I raised some time back to the Minister of Works. That one has been not attended to. Only three minutes and there are so many members who want to contribute. Onabachon, play. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I uh, support the motion to pay the tribute for Archbishop Luanga. Honorable Madam Speaker and Honorable Members, we are all aware the Bible tells us there is no time for that. If we would know, some of us, they would still request God to hold them back. I want to say sorry to the family for our late bishop and the Catholic diocese for whatever has happened. And I want to thank the late for the contribution he did for this country. He was among those who rejected the bill for homosexuality not to be accepted. What I will request, Madam Speaker, a move around the world when extraordinary person dies in this country we do not have a book to learn the history of that person I would request such a person like this father bishop who passed away I think something must be written so the younger generation should not forget they would love to do they would love to be like him this one thing which I would request as we are here as a member of parliament, we are aware all of us one time they will pay a tribute to us. But we want to make sure we should do a good job while we're still alive in this world. And you must have a good record. And you must have a book written for your life, not only to be on the internet. This is one thing which I would appeal for our country. Madam Speaker, I pray may his soul rise in peace. Thank you. All right, Honorable Speaker, and dear colleagues, I stand here to pay tribute to the late Dr. Seprian Kizitorwanga. We must all appreciate what this gentleman did for this country. This man was developmental. For us, where he started as a bishop, their landmarks in churches, schools, hospitals, you say what? They are there for everybody to see. This gentleman, the Archbishop Luanga, learned what this priest should do. Don't just come to preach, oh Jesus at Capernaum, what? No! People want also social service. That's why he was involved in the weekend. That's why he was involved in so many things to bring up the people. So we really thank the late Cyprian Kizitorwanga. I like him because he was a man who told the people what they were supposed to hear. He's not among those who talk, talk, talk people on things they, what those people want to hear. He was outspoken on the point and rightful. What can I remember what I did with the Archbishop? With the Namugongo, when they were looking for money to build it, 
The church had some land at Entebbe Airport. When I was the Minister of Works and Transport, he approached me, he explained, I saw the sense, and I agreed that their, their bills should be paid, and they were paid. The second thing I did with Archbishop, the Northern Bypass Road going to Munyonyo, the designers had, had passed through the Basilica. When they explained to me, I told these technical people, please, immediately redesign, relocate, and leave that place alone. And it was relocated. So at least I did something on the request of the Archbishop. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the Archbishop was a wonderful man. When he was working with, the, as the Prime Minister said, with the late Cardinal Emmanuel Insuga, I met him there because I was doing some work with the late Archbishop Emmanuel Insuga. In engineering, he had a relatively good architect and I was doing the engineering work. So I pray that those who are in that business of being preachers, nuns and whatnot, please follow and copy what the Archbishop Dr. Cyprian Kizitoranga has done. May his soul rest in eternal peace. Thank you. Thank you. Kibaria. Kibaria, Sengo, Abala. No, we are coming. We are coming. I'm coming like this. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, I wish to join the colleagues in paying tribute to the great Archbishop Dr. Cyprian Chizitoluanga. Right Honorable Speaker, I thank God that I've lived in a generation where I've seen Dr. Cyprian Chizitoluanga. Right Honorable Speaker, Dr. Cyprian Chizitoluanga was a religious leader. But he played the role of changing lives of Ugandans more than us, the leaders that have that task. Right, Honorable Speaker, wherever you go, wherever you hear any journey where Dr. Cipriano Chizitoluanga passed, somebody will be there to give a testimony that my life has changed because of Dr. Cipriano Chizitoluanga. He's a leader who has changed the people's lives. Our president is somebody who promotes, he says, Chivalo, you, yes, you are doing this and the other, but what about your home? What about your personal income? Dr. Cipriano Chizitoranga realized he was a preacher. He was leading his people, but he had to change their lives. We are told those ones that approached him at that time, that he could ask you, how much do you have? so that he adds something on that to make sure your life from there and then changes. That was the great man. Right on our speaker, Dr. Cipriano Chizitoranga, one time we shared when they told me his background with the Mapera house. And we were wondering whether we could change the name of Mapera house to the name of Cipriano Chizitoranga. They said it's hard because of some Catholic lines. But it was... Mapera House was purely the brain of Dr. Cipriano Chizitoluanga. The Sentinel Banker that we see now, the Sentinel Bank, the way we sit now, the only Ugandan banker that we are proud of, our banker that we feel this is our bank, that is the Sentinel Bank, the brain we see is Dr. Cipriano Chizitoluanga. Dr. Ch Cipriano Chizitoluanga was born after Namag Namugongo existed. But he came up with the formula, with the model, with what we see in Namugongo now. We were sharing with some parents when we, Dr. Cipriano Chizitoluanga was being buried. Right on Honorable Speaker, we are told Dr. Cipriano Chizitoluanga had around 400 children that he was paying school fees for as a person. This is the gentleman, this is the doctor, this is the archbishop that we are talking of now. Right on our speaker, the prime minister is here. Just one second, right on our speaker, since uh, uh, as I bring tribute from the Soga Kingdom. Right on our speaker, since the prime minister is here. The we, as we believe and appreciate what we did, we need to do something.
so that at that time when we shall be talking about Dr. Cipriano Chizito Lwanga our children will see something to know that when you do something very unique and different the country can remember you in this formula Ugandans can remember you in this but when we see ladies crying with that association of Wekembe because they don't see the future now we are sharing with those ladies they are wondering the next step because of what Dr. Cipriano Chizitoruanga did. So as government, we need to do something in recognition of his great efforts to help us as leaders build this country, do what we had failed to do as leaders so that the generation to come can also live to testify that a great man lived once at a time when Dr. Right Honorable Rakana Lugunda was the Prime Minister of this country. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Sengo. Honorable members, uh, I think as I call Honorable Sengo, let me also add some uh, more testimony from Busoga. Right now, Prime Minister, one day I had gone to Bukungu, our landing site, and they talked to me about the need for water, need for roads, need for that. Then finally they said, Madam, next time you come, we shall be dead. I said, what, what do you mean we shall be dead? said, we are going to kill each other. Why? Why are you going to kill each other? said, each of these houses you see, the landing site has got money. Every day we sell things, we have no bank. That's why we are saying we are going to kill one another. So I, I got concerned. I wrote the Minister of Finance. I said, I, we need a bank in the extreme north of Busoga. Because we in the Kamudi, Ruka, there were no banks. I wrote all these important banks in Uganda. Please establish a branch in the extreme north. No one was interested. But when I talked to Dr. Sifriyan Chicholwanga and told him my problem, he said, leave it to me. That's how Sitinari Bank went to Kamuli. So for me, uh, that's why when Honorable Bonachi says uh, our relationship, I held him in very, very high regard for solving a problem of our people. Thank you. I thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. I join my colleagues in paying condolences to our fallen great spiritual father. Madam Speaker, I came to know the late Archbishop way back in the, in the 70s when I was still a resident of uh, Najan Ankumbi. At that time, when the late Archbishop was still a priest, a young priest, he was assigned to, to start a South Parish and later on a parish of Undeba. We started off just a few people in a papyrus site. The, the later Archbishop was assigned to develop that place. Madam Speaker, the Archbishop was a wizard at development. He was very, very developmental. Because after a few years, we were able to, he was able to construct a church for us, and by now, Neva is one of the biggest parishes in this, uh, in this archdiocese. Madam Speaker, I think all Ugandans should borrow a leaf from the late Archbishop. This is a man who, uh, who welcomed everybody regardless of his religion. This is a man who loved the peace. This is a man who always said the truth. Indeed, Uganda has lost a great leader. Uganda has lost a great church leader of the Catholic Church. Every time I met him, he would refer to me as his parishioner of Undeva. I always wonder that his very, very good memory, he would never forget a person that, is, that was our Archbishop. Madam Speaker, have a feeling that this country has a number of problems. And I also believe that we don't die. Even when we die, we remain alive wherever we go. I'm sure the late Archbishop is aware of all the problems we are facing in Uganda. And I hope and I'm convinced that we pray for this country so that we overcome all these problems. May his soul rest in eternal peace. Thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker. Honorable Babala. Babala. Babadiri. Tayewa. 
Deu um caminho. Move more narrow of the body a bit closer. Madam Speaker, first of all, I want to thank God that uh, He made uh, our late bishop to be born here in Uganda. If He had decided for Him to be born elsewhere, we would not be talking about Him now and we would not be celebrating His life now. But because God made Him in His own image and made Him to be in here in Uganda, I, that's why I want to thank God. I also want to thank government for for the support they accorded for the burial uh, of uh, late bishop, archbishop. Then I also want to thank the speaker and the parliament for allowing this motion to be moved today. Madam Speaker, the problem, uh, the problem of death. First of all, death has no formula. It has no home. It has no sub-county. It has no country. So what we must only do is only to thank God when we are still alive. We should not uh, uh, forget that uh, for us, anytime we can die. But, also, uh, but before you die, let's do a good job like the, 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 the late Archbishop actually has done a wonderful job as you have had. Madam Speaker, let me just read some, since he was an Archbishop, allow me to read some of you two verses from the Bible. Uh, he was a bishop and he preached. By the way, he was a man who was a preacher of the Word of God. And uh, let, this goes to all of us and uh, uh, all of us who are mourning. Revelation chapter 21 verse 4 says, He will wipe away every tear from their, eye, from their eyes, and death shall, no, shall, shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things are passed away. That is according uh, to the Bible. So, you know, he did a good job, and now, for example, for us, we are mourning. But all this mourning is going to end. It is going to end. I want to tell everybody, it will end, and it will end. Uh, in the second, in the first Thessalonians chapter verse 14 says, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring him with him those who have fallen asleep. Uh, what I, I'm sure our Archbishop actually has fallen asleep. So for him, when the Christ is going to resurrect, he will also resurrect with the Christ. So one thing I want to appeal to all of us, let us work very, very hard as, a, as, a, as a Christians. Uh, let's be an example like he was an example to everybody. For him, he was a, a man who, he was not selective. He, never, he was a man who loved everyone. And for me, by the way, I'm a man, I'm a man of those few people who do not, uh, who do not know, understand the uh, language in Uganda properly. But every time when he was uh, preaching, I got interested in understanding the language called Uganda. Because I did know. So that's why I could ask, what does, what does he say? Because for me, at least, uh, he's, he was a man. Madam Speaker, just, to, uh, just one minute. Just, just one minute to, 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 sum up, to sum up. Madam Speaker, I want to say, he was a uh, bishop, uh, archbishop, he was a great preacher. He was a man who was pro development. He was a man who wanted to protect the rights of uh, 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 everybody in this country. He was a man who preached about love, about forgiveness, against corruption, against social ills. He supported the uh, development of this country. That's why, for me, my opinion, uh, like uh, the minister earlier on said, that uh, if, the, if he has met the, all the criteria to be, to be never the matter, in the more, I, would, I would not oppose it. I would say, okay, police is among those who qualifies, if he has met the, all the requirements. Number two, Madam Speaker, like my brother is, is Chibalia said, now that he has done it, he did a good job, and he's an example now in this country, I would appeal to the government, now that the Prime Minister is here, I am happy he's the one who brought this motion here, that the uh, uh, Prime Minister and the government, uh, you put there a very powerful hospital, uh, a powerful hospital in the memory of this powerful man who served Uganda with one heart, a man f free of corruption, free of segregation, free of religious uh, uh, problems. He was a man who only knew that we must serve Christ and serve God and be in heaven. May God raise his soul in the eternal peace. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Babadidi. For the better you were, then I come to the team here. A call. Go on, Saga. Would you come? Okay, I've seen you. I've seen you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, for giving me this opportunity. 
Madam Speaker, on behalf of the people of Koboko and on my own behalf, I would like to pay my sincere condolences to the family of Grace Cyprian Kizito Luanga for the ending. The Christians of Uganda, especially the Catholics and the Uganda at large, because we have lost a very great man. Madam Speaker, his grace, Kizito Luanga, was a dedicated servant of God. He devoted his whole life to the people of Uganda to ensure that they develop both spiritually, mentally, and bodily. Madam Speaker, spiritually, his grace ensured that if you are a Christian, Catholic Christian, you must be practical, not only going to pray, but just not having sacraments, not having, you must follow and ensure that you go to heaven, not just to show that you are a Christian. That one good quality I've seen him in his preaching. Then mentally, he ensured that the children are all educated and he started the schools in all parts, not only in his area, but other parts of Uganda. Broadly, he ensured that people are economically and socially healthy and had money. So that is what he did. He believed that a Christian must be somebody who is wholly developed. Madam Speaker, his grace was a true leader. He was born as a leader. Right from his family, he exhibited the signs of leadership in his school life. And even when he became a priest, he just served shortly and he was appointed as a Paris priest. From Paris priest to a bishop, from bishop to archbishop. And even if he had lived longer, he could even become a cardinal. But unfortunately, he is short-lived. Madam Speaker, let us think about the death of uh, his grace. He's young, 66 is a young age. He could still do more work. But he died on Good Friday. He died together with Jesus. I understand on Saturday, on Thursday, he collected all his priests around him. They had the supper together, just like the one of Jesus' last supper. Then on Saturday, he died. Saturday night, he died. I'm sure he died together with Jesus, and they rose together with Jesus. He will be together. He's now there with Jesus. May his soul rest in eternal peace. Thank you very much. Madam. Thank you very much. Then on a call, would you case Gonzaga? I'm coming this side now. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Let me take this opportunity to thank the Right Honorable Prime Minister for moving this motion and for you, Right Honorable Speaker, for getting space on the order paper. Right Honorable Speaker, I happened to work with the, His Grace when we were organizing SECAM, when we hosted over 400 cardinals, bishops, archbishops here in 2019 and um, I was appointed the National Secretary for Finance. I was the chief fundraiser and we moved around, started raising funds together to have a very successful SECAM. I remember when we were stuck somehow, we tapped into his friendship with you, right honorable speaker because we did not have vehicles we had a budget of over 700 million for hiring vehicles, and he said, just go to my friend Rebecca. And when we came, you signed for us, and we used the brand new vehicles, which were meant for CPA conference, which we had just brought. Right, Honorable Speaker, I'm very, very sure, even wherever he is, he's still thanking you and Parliament. Right, Honorable Speaker, in the same moment, when we were stuck, he said, no, my friend, the president, will always be there for the Catholic community. And he managed to link us, and the president gave us $4 billion, which we used to host a very successful function. But in all that, he told us two things. One, that in whatever we are doing when we are talking about spiritual welfare of the nation, we should also talk about economic welfare of the nation. And he was preaching it, he was living it, and he was helping many people 
to get into the money economy, not only the spiritual economy, but also the money economy. Right, Honorable Speaker, another thing which we have to look into deeply as readers in this country, which His Grace was always talking about, is the issue of pro-life, protecting the, life, the lives of the unborn children. We have thousands of abortions on demand sponsored in this country every day. The church has cried out. Now there is what they call abortion on demand. Someone wants to go to a club, they go, they abort, they go to a club, they will go and look for another child. Right on our speaker, as readers in this country, we have to look into that issue deeper. If we want the church to be our partner in fighting for economic liberation of the country, we must work with it to fight for moral to fight for moral liberation of the country. May the soul of his rest in peace. Right, Honorable Speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Bakor. I've seen you. You can sit, I've seen you. Madam Speaker, allow me to thank the government, the Prime Minister, and uh, your office to give us this opportunity to talk about a man who understood his purpose for creation. Because the problem we have in this world is that sometimes we fail to know the purpose why we are created. So he left us with very important wealth, spiritual wealth and community wealth we are talking about. And that is key and very important for this country. But also when we are talking here, it is important to think now as we are praising a uh, doctor for what he has done in this world that he left us with a will, and the will he left on Friday, on a good Friday, is that we should do justice to Ugandans, political prisoners. What is government going to do on the will that he has left behind? He left a very serious will that we have to think about, and we have to do it in favor to remember him. And I would say that we should use this opportunity to demand from government to release the political uh, prisoners who are in prison now, those who are abducted during this period. We are just a piece of meat walking around with uh, blood flowing on it. And I think we should think about each other. We are born in the same way, and that is a kind of preaching that the bishop was leaving us with. And I think, for me, I would want everybody to think, who will cry when you die? We are crying because of the community wealth that he left in the world. He touched the life of people. He did not think about touching his own life. He did not build wealth for himself. People will not remember you for the money you left in the bank. They will not remember you for the houses you have built, but they will remember you the life you have touched in the community. And that is the most important thing that we should take in the life of Bishop. As a Catholic, I demand and I request for government to fulfill the will of the bishop, of the bishop, the archbishop. Thank you very much. May his soul rest in peace. Thank you, Nabisa Bagara. Then, Gonzaga, Mwijuke, Nambeshe, Oshave, Ati, Aiv, I've seen you, Oto. The ladies from Akech, I've seen all of you. Thank you very much, right honorable speakers. Madam Speaker, on behalf of the Muslim Parliamentary Caucus, Allow me also to add my voice and support the motion. Madam Speaker, the late Archbishop was a religious leader who united all of us, regardless of our religious affiliations, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the late Archbishop was a human rights defender. And indeed, if we are to honor him, we must also ensure that we defend human rights, especially of those who are oppressed. Madam Speaker, I remember very vividly when we are around, I think, by the end of uh, last year, when the Archbishop, the late Archbishop, came out to request the government to suspend the elections because of uh, there was too much human rights violations. And also, in the interest of protecting Ugandans, 
maybe because of, uh, of COVID, he requested that no, we should suspend the elections so that we could really protect all Ugandans. He was not in politics, but he wanted every Ugandan to be safe and free. That's why he requested that we postpone the elections. No, there are not many religious leaders who come out boldly to tell the government what's supposed to be done. Madam Speaker, I know in some of his uh, last sermons, he was talking about defending all Ugandans in as far as human rights are concerned. He has been appealing to government that please, this is by the suit operatives in as far as handling Ugandans is concerned or arresting Ugandans, they should change for the better. Madam Speaker, we have lost a person who has been a unifying factor in as far as our country is concerned. May his soul rest in peace. Thank you, Honorable Gonzaga. So, Ungu, then Nambeshe, then Oshabe, Komakech, Rusi, I think I saw a room somewhere there. Mahmoud, I've seen you. I've seen you. Thank you, Mr. Lord Speaker. It's just at the back there. Okay. There is a, a tall man and sitting at the back. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Lord Speaker. I also join other members in support of the motion. And above all, I thank you so much for according us this time to respect the Archbishop. And also, I want to send condolences to you because we are going to be one of those who are going to attend Easter with him. And unfortunately, they were prepared for you with the individual administrator, but you did not make it because the way God brought this. But, Mr. Speaker, some of us, when you see us putting on these rosaries, we want to imitate these archbishops and bishops. That's why I put on my cross as they normally put on. Since I fade the other side, I try in this kind of behavior. Secondly, I've been, I'm one of the member of, members of parliament, very few who have been moving the Archbishop on every Good Friday for the public way of the cross. And I've carried out this since 1994 when I came to Kampala, moving with him from Luwaga. And indeed, right now, Speaker, I only missed, I never communicated with somebody who tell me that there was a public way of the cross at uh, Namirembe. I would have been with the Archbishop. Even then, right now, Speaker, he has also been my, our patron at the Popopo Social Club, where I spend my evening to see some time, spend some of my income for some enjoyment. <laughs> and uh, this alone, that no speaker, really? made me a very close friend of the Archbishop. We Catholics, we have a word we use in Latin. We say, Roma Rocuta Causa Fenita. What the Pope has said, you cannot object. But the Pope has never said that you, Archbishop, died. But once he brought him to Kampala, not many of us knew him, but when he began his work, we worked with him and we did. And one time I was the teacher of one of the Catholic schools after Shimon was demolished. The Archbishop gave me a job in marching in When I was speaker, I want to put this on record, no members. In Buganda and any other culture, there's no way you go to attend a funeral and you go there for only a, a tour. It was unfortunate, I know, Speaker, that the, the, the spokesperson of government, Mr. Ofono Bondo, on a public television said, I'm not a Christian, I don't worship, but I went to Rubaga for a, a tour. This one was painful, but well knowing the acts and behaviors of this gentleman, I never wanted. However, uh, such utterances are not welcome. Madam Speaker, the Archbishop built more development in children. Madam Speaker, in Uganda, we have associations which build children, that number Prime Minister. One, the Uganda Scouts, which is already dead in your regime. The Gallo Guides is not functioning in your regime. They are not working. But the Archbishop started the Banachi Zito. And this one has spread in a number of schools where they are building children to grow morally so that they resemble, they imitate that saint who, who, who has killed young and is a, a martyr. As I conclude, now, Speaker, let me pray, right of Prime Minister, 
This country needs a council of elders. Can you sit down as a government if you feel you are serious and build what we call a council of elders? Right on our speaker, the Archbishop raised a number of complaints about security to the extent of saying that one time his priest had a guard. These priests are also human beings. Don't think they don't make mistakes. Actually, they are given seven sins per day according to our belief. But when they come out to utter what they feel is wrong, then new government start also attacking them and threatening them, intimidating them, and spying on them. Once you put up a council of elders in this country, it can help the long-serving president who thinks he cannot leave this government to solve some of these problems that they are bringing so that this country can move forward. Right now, Speaker, I pray that Honorable Members, Madam Speaker, we are given each a copy in their pigeon holes by the Episcopal Council on different issues that were related to elections of 2021 in December. And every member got a copy before elections were carried out. Please, Honorable Members, go and read what the archbishops, the bishops wrote about elections that took place and internalize them so that when you come back here, we act for the country in a sober mind. Right now, Speaker, thank you for according me this time. May his soul rest in eternal peace. Thank you. Followed by Nambeshe. Thank you so much, Right Honourable Speaker. Right Honourable Speaker, I stand here to pay tribute to the great Archbishop. Right Honourable Speaker, as we debate, I know many of the religious leaders are, are watching us, they are listening, and this is a very great lesson to them. We are saying he was a great archbishop because of being open. He feared nothing. You, the pastors, watching us, the bishops, the reverend fathers, the reverend, the catches, the laity, come up and advocate for good governance and rule of law. Expose the dictators, the corrupt, the robbers, the land grabbers, the abusers of human rights, the murderers, come up. It is the reason why we are paying tribute. Sometimes I ask myself, if he not died, what would have been government's response to his, to his statements on Friday? Because when you die, the statements change. You will come and say he, was, he, he spoke the truth. I am sure the, the, the spokesperson we have just talk, uh, uh, talked about here would have been saying what is his business in, in the rest of Ugandans. But, but because he, he went, everybody is uh, saying he was a good man. Finally, right on our speaker, the Prime Minister has defended the motion, justified it, and I am very happy that the government has come up with this. But I expected him to say now, because of this good Archbishop, we are going to deal with the issues he was raising in respect to the arbitrary killings and arrests. But he still has an opportunity. I am sure before he goes, he will speak to the statement of the Archbishop. Otherwise, it doesn't make a lot of sense for us to come here and praise the Archbishop, yet he left two issues. There is those we are not taking to court. Where are they? If we can't speak about that, right now, uh, Prime Minister, we are just deceiving the nation. I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Nambeshe, Oshave, Komakech, Lucy Akelo. I get the middle. Huh? Yes, that's why I've seen her sh <laughs> the back there. Uh, uh, th thank you, right Honorable Speaker. Let me join colleagues to pay glowing tribute to the fallen Archbishop. Dr. Cyprian Luanga. Madam Speaker, I kept watching on that day when the Archbishop was being afforded a deserved send-off, and then it was akin to the previous week when they were burying or mourning the fallen gallant son of the People's Republic of Tanzania. 
And uh, what flooded my mind, Madam Speaker, is that the success of a man or a woman in this world is not in the much wealth you amass around you, is not in how long you cling to power, or even remove uh, uh, those uh, limits that could have actually limited you, but it is in the how long you remain in the memories of the people that you served. And I saw the mourners indeed were mourning because of how he had touched their hearts and minds because of the ded dedicated service with passion. Madam Speaker, Archbishop Dr. Cyprian Luanga is only second to the Archbishop, the late Archbishop General Lumu. All the social ills and across human rights violations that Lumu condemned are happening today. And uh, he's the only cleric that came out to speak truth to power. Madam Speaker, even before he passed away, he had almost fervently asked the government to release the political prisoners. And now, on that note, therefore, now that the Right Honorable Prime Minister who moved the motion is here, he has set a marker that we ought to emulate. And the best tribute that you could pay to the fallen Archbishop Dr. Cyprian Luanga is to unconditionally release these political prisoners. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I realize that uh, the president, when he was actually eulogizing the fallen uh, cleric, he mentioned the contribution, the enormous contribution that he had. Just say, just say. Please conclude. Huh? Please conclude. I'm, I'm concluding. Uh, that he, the contribution that he had made uh, purportedly when they were still in the bush in Uruero. And I liked the way he was lionizing the Archbishop Dr. Cyprian Luanga. And I wondered why this could not have been done like it is always done when someone is still alive. I've seen so many medals being uh, given to uh, gallant sons of this country, but that we wait for them to pass away and then we lionize them. Uh, does not augur well with some people who are so God fearing like uh, myself. Uh, with these few remarks, <laughs> may he so rest in the eternal peace. May Ushave, Ushave, Komakech, Onabu Akelo, Lucy. I've got you on my list, don't worry. Uh, you have just arrived. Right, Honorable Speaker, thank you, thank you so much for allowing time for this motion. I will begin by thanking the Prime Minister Ndugu Rugunda for within your motion you properly described the man Dr. Spirian Chizitorwanga as a man who respected the rule of law, a man who desired constitutionalism and a man who had a high respect for human rights, freedoms, peace, and justice. Thank you, because you really described him well, because those are some of the values uh, Dr. Spiri and Chizito Rwanga stood for. Right, Honorable Speaker, at a time when we experienced uh, threats for crushing NUP supporters during elections, Dr. Spirian Chizitorwanga's voice was heard speaking to authority. At a time when we experienced kidnaps, murders by the state, Dr. Spirian Chizitorwanga's voice was heard on the pulpit. Right on over speaker, at a time when some ministers asked him to leave politics, and concentrate on religious matters, he never relented. 
He kept on preaching peace. He kept on preaching justice. In fact, many honorable members have reminded us that on the day he celebrated the uh, way of the cross mass, he spoke for justice. He desired that all people that uh, right honorable prime minister you arrested your government arrested your state agencies arrested during the politics should be released and there is no more gift you can give to him there is no more gift you can give to the people of Uganda if you do uh, what he desired uh, uh, the archbishop uh, so much we will miss a freedom fighter. We will miss a religious leader who never missed his words whenever he's speaking for the people uh, using uh, the position uh, he has. Many people, right or wrong speaker, choose to hide, they, to bury their heads in the sun when injustices are going on in our country. Every one of us deserves a better Uganda. And that's what the Archbishop really stood for. May his soul rest in eternal peace. Thank you, Honorable Komakech, Lucia Kelo, Santa Room, Makmot, Basarido, Aivu, and the Tat. Madam Speaker, on behalf of the people of Gulu City, I also join in to support the motion that has been moved by the Prime Minister, Comrade Ndugu Arugunda. In Latin, it said, in omnia paratus, always be ready for anything. Archbishop Luanga, born from the Mamba clan, and as you're aware that the Mamba clan is the largest clan in Buganda Kingdom. And the Buganda were very wise to create actually totems because clans protected the environment. If you belong to the Mamba clan, that meant you would not eat that fish called Mamba. Otherwise, the Mamba clan would finish the Mamba in Lake Victoria. Madam Speaker, Archbishop Luanga stood and fulfilled what we call the apostolic succession right from a lady to a priest to a bishop to archbishop he was going on but he fulfilled them if you look at the virtues in the cardinal canon law the first section is about theological values, virtues. He fulfilled the issues regarding faith as a leader in the church. He fulfilled the issues of hope. He gave hope to those who are hopeless. He stood for charity about love as archbishop. And then the second bracket of virtues, that is all about the cardinal virtues. He fulfilled them on the issues of prudence regarding wisdom as a Catholic prelate. He looked at fortitude about courage. He was courageous. We have talked about issues he raised to the government of Uganda that you may need to fulfill uh, in your reply at the end of this. About temperance, he did it. That's about self-control. He taught citizens, young children, all of us. When we were being given orientation when we came in this 10th parliament, he met us in Pope Paul and he said, first thing I need you to do is struggle and use Christian lenses in your legislation in Parliament. That is what we do here. So Please conclude. Madam Speaker, our legislation here, we have learned from him that if you look 
at certain virtues and you use those as lenses to do legislation, the law will always be respected. I stand firm to bear witness that he was one of the greatest uh, pro-life advocates. That is why I wear this badge about pro-life. This is about standing for the life of those that are unborn and those to be born. May his soul rest in eternal peace. Thank you. Can I Patri, at Felix Dos Santos. Thank you. Honorable Lucy. Then uh, Honorable Lum. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Uh, allow me also add my voice in thanking the Prime Minister for bringing this motion to pay tribute to our father. Madam Speaker, allow me also to thank you for finding space to allow us members of parliament on behalf of the people that we represent to pay tribute to this great man. Madam Speaker, as I was walking here, uh, I had Honorable Sentinel calling me Nava Cristo. But the Archbishop never called me Nava Cristo. He always called me Sava Cristo. And that is how it is. Um, Madam, Madam Speaker, a lot can be said about the Archbishop. Personally, I knew the Archbishop way back when I was working with the Justice and Peace Commission, Archdiocese of Gulu. I was the Executive Secretary, and oftentimes we would meet to discuss issues of development because at that time he was the president of Caritas Uganda and at one time he was also the president Caritas Africa. And I am not surprised with the developments that came with that position that he held. And for me this raised a big question. How many of us in this Uganda when given an opportunity to hold big offices, will actually use it for the common man and woman. The Archbishop did exactly that. How many of us, if given an opportunity, would sacrifice their salary to ensure that we empower women? The Archbishop did just that. And the information I wanted to give at one point to Honorable Morris about Centenary Bank, the Mapera building. The story I heard about the Mapera building is that it was built on zero loan and it was purely on savings. What lessons can we learn as a country? Can we survive without some of these big loans? Another thing, Madam Speaker, is that everyone has spoken very well about the late Archbishop. Okay, Sawa Christoph, one minute. Okay. Thank you. I will now summarize. Um, one thing that also touched my heart, Madam Speaker, then I will conclude is that the Archbishop, even amidst his busy schedule, he would find time every Easter season, every Boxing Day, to visit and spend time with his family. This is a challenge to all of us. How many of us can do this? Finally, Madam Speaker, everything that has been said is summarized in Matthew Chapter, four, uh, chapter 25, and this is for all of us here. Chapter 25, start from verse 34. But what I want to conclude with is in verse 40, which states that whatsoever you do to the least of my brothers and my sisters, you do unto me 
Whatsoever you do to the least of my brothers, that you do unto me. When I was hungry, you gave me to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. Now enter into the house of my father. May you rest in peace, our Papa. Rest in peace, Archbishop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hola, Santa. Santa, um, Mahmoud, Atiku. I'm coming. I'm coming for the final round. I've got you. I've seen it. Seen it. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. On behalf of the people of Oyam District, and my own behalf, I want to thank you, Right Honorable Speaker, for allowing me to participate in paying tribute to the East Great, the late Dr. Ciprian Kizito Luanga. Madam Speaker, the sudden death of His Grace, Dr. Kizito Luanga, triggered a flood of tears and emotion among his members of his family, the Christian community, and the country at large. Madam Speaker, this was so because he was a man of multitude praises by his peers, very faithful, brilliant, decisive, and a pleasant individual who was done to us. Madam Speaker, my first job after the university was at the National Seminary, Gaba, where I had the privilege of interacting with the bishops. And Madam Speaker, as just like any human being, His Grace had his happy moments, and whenever he was excited, he would do so. And he had a great sense of humor, and very friendly even to us, the staff who worked at the National Seminary, Gaba. Madam Speaker, as a bishop, His Grace, the late Archbishop, Dr. Ciprian Kizito Luanga, left a mark on the social, political, economic aspect of the life of people in this country. Madam Speaker, as his life was criticized, uh, characterized by love, peace, unity, and economic empowerment, two most, most especially the women and the children. Madam Speaker, as mentioned by my colleague, the late Archbishop started a project for the children called the Bana Bakazitu. Madam Speaker, this shows that he has a real uh, lenses to look into the future of this country as relying on the children. How best can we remember him by emulating this very important uh, foresight? Madam Speaker, we have been told that the lady worked so hard, Madam Speaker, to improve the life of the voiceless and the poor. And Madam Speaker, I would like to urge the Prime Minister, who is the mover of this motion, that really, as the Archbishop spoke about the human rights abuses, as he spoke uh, and he worked so hard, uh, about the plight of the poor people. How best are we going to remember him to make sure that the injustices that we see in this country these days does not uh, uh, increase? How best are we going to remember him, Madam Speaker, to make sure that we remove our people from poverty, Madam Speaker? Madam Speaker, as a, a great uh, shepherd, I pray that may his legacy remain longer and forever, and may the Almighty God grant the great shepherd eternal rest. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Sarira. Ben Makmot.
Thank you very much, Vatron Speaker. Vatron Speaker, I join colleagues in mourning the demise of the Archbishop, and I want to appreciate the Vatron Prime Minister for the motion to mourn the Archbishop. Vatron Speaker, I must confess that I was not so close to the Archbishop before 2019. But after the events in Arua, when Honorable Robert Chagulani sent and the Honorable Francis Zaki were brutalized, they were admitted in Rubaga Hospital, and uh, I was responsible for clearing people who were going to visit them. So I received a call from the wife of the Honorable Robert Chagulani that that bishop was scheduled to visit uh, Bobby Wine and Zake in Rubaga. So I went to Rubaga, and I welcomed the Archbishop to the hospital and into their rooms. And while there, he looked at them and prayed for them. He had carried two very big envelopes, and he gave one to the Honorable Robert Chagulani and another to the Honorable Francis Zake. After the prayers, I asked the Archbishop whether I could take a photo with him. And he did accept it, and I took a photo with him that I have made my profile picture on my WhatsApp up to now, in memory of that bishop. But as he was leaving right on speaker, he did make a statement to the effect that whenever there was an opportunity for us, one, to forgive those who had tormented us in Arua, we should forgive. Then two, he said, if you have an opportunity to speak and engage in peaceful activities, we should do. I knew him as a man of peace, as a man who loved to engage, and as a man who spoke truth to power. Right now, Speaker, as we mourn the demise of the late Archbishop, we will ask a difficult question. Who is going to speak truth to power the way Archbishop Kizito Ranga has been doing? May his soul rest in peace. Thank you. Honorable Mahmoud. Mahmoud, Atiku. Uh, just come. Oh then I take the last three on this side. Thank you, the right honourable speaker. The right honourable speaker, on behalf of the people of Agago County, and on my own behalf, I rise to to uh, support the motion by the right honourable prime minister, paying tribute to uh, uh, our fallen hero. Uh, the Archbishop of the Catholic Church. Uh, uh, the Right Honourable Speaker, when the news of the, the passing away of the Archbishop came, I was in uh, Agago, I was in the constituency, and I stayed in for about a week, and I, I watched the effect on that, uh, that side of the country. I, I must uh, say that uh, this was a, a big shock to the, to the Catholic, greatly a Catholic community in Agago, and, uh, and I think it was a very unifying thing altogether at the end of the day. Madam Speaker, um, I, I think the, 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 the character of the Archbishop is a true hallmark of what we have always known as the, the, Catholic, the Catholic principles. He spoke the truth, he was a true friend, he's, he's a person who was very, very friendly also to government at the same time, but he also was very honest with government, and I think that is what a true friend should be. I think he was able to speak out in times of difficulty, and it reminds me about uh, what uh, one of the greatest prime ministers uh, who is respected for, for civil rights li uh, liberties, what he said, he said uh, that is Prime Minister Trudeau, he said that the whole the hallmark, the test of a developed nation is not necessarily the skyscrapers, but how the country treats its lowest member of society. And I think uh, the, 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 the Archbishop actually was uh, a living example of that by what he has done and which many people have talked about. He was very humble and I think he did not ashamed the prophet. I mean, he was very highly educated, a doctor, and many times we, we think doctors over follow the line and all that. People were highly educated, but I think he defied the horde and uh, uh, we miss him at this time when credibility of leadership in many churches is, is, is an issue. 
many times we, when I grew up, you know, a church leader was of a certain nature, uh, Christ-like in many ways. And I think uh, we really miss him because I think uh, he had those attributes that brought a lot of respect to the church. And for me, it restored my faith. So uh, 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 that legacy is great. And I and, uh, Farewell, D, and we pray for his soul to rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Atiku. Ogwal. Honorable Opendi. Taka. Dr. Moriko, I think you'll come last. Uh, Thank you. Hajat Saida. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. I stand here. Nyendoha. That Nyendoha. I met them on the other side. Okay. Rakojo. Anyway, what did he was a great man. Let's give him time. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. I join colleagues in supporting the motion moved by the Right Honorable Prime Minister to pay tribute to a gallant son of Uganda and the shepherd of God or God's people. Madam Speaker, on behalf of the people of uh, Ayuvu County and Arua Diocese, we condole with the family and the Catholic, Catholic fraternity. Madam Speaker, as colleagues have said, people like the late Dr. Cyprian Luanga should not have died in a manner in which, because this is a soul from which a lot more was still expected at a time when the country is crying for leadership for unity Madam Speaker we must all agree that as a country we are at crossroads and in moments like this we need people like the late Dr. Cyprian to bring leaders together and preach peace and unity. Madam Speaker, the late will be remembered for many more developments initiated within the shortest period in which he offered leadership. Of course, once some of them have been mentioned, the towering Mapera House, for which many Catholics are proud, and also designing the skyline of Kampala, the capital city. Madam Speaker, one of the projects in which we've been participating, which the late initiated with other archbishops, the Catholic Television Project, that is now a testing stage, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the late spoke the truth and we expect government to, as one of the ways, practical ways, of saying that indeed, Madam Speaker, a minute, that we respect the late is to heed to some of the issues that he pointed to government before he breathed his last. And one of those was the issue of dialogue, the issue of releasing political prisoners, and Madam Speaker, to hold those accountable for the loss of lives in the last general elections, Madam Speaker. Right Honorable Prime Minister, I believe these are things that can hold Uganda together. The issues that have happened in this country are not beyond us. So I expect Right Honorable Prime Minister Nduguru Hakana to lead in establishing dialogue amidst this situation of uncertainty in our country. I thank you. May your soul rest in eternal peace, Doctor. Thank now, you. Now, over the centenary, then I take the last group on the side. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, I would like to thank the mover of the motion and the seconders, and I stand here to support the motion. 
And in particular, I want to thank the Prime Minister for summarizing the character of a servanthood leadership in, the, in His Grace, the Archbishop. He, he has summarized it for us very well. He said he was a strong advocate of, of the rule of law, of constitutionalism, and respect of human rights, freedom, unity, and national cohesion. This is a glorious description of what the man was. And right honorable sp speaker, I want to say, when I learned that the bishop was very condemnational of the Obote regime for Pandagari practices of those days, uh, I was comforted because he was also very, very condemnational of the, of the recent abduction, arrest, and abuse of rights of people. Right, Honorable Speaker, all of us subject our leadership to the authority of Christ when we hold the Bible and we swear when we become members of Parliament. And I want to urge the Prime Minister and uh, members of government to listen to the last word of His Grace, the Archbishop. He talked about the respect for rights and justice. It is therefore important that we should take his last word as something we should not ignore. Secondly, right honorable speaker, I was moved that this is uh, a man of God, but he cared about the plight of the women by setting up a circus for them. He cared about children who otherwise would not be going to school. So I'm urging the prime minister, urging the government through you, that if you could spend 300 million for burial expenses, can you at least release 500 million to send the 400 children who ought to have gone to school? But because this grace has passed on, we do not know what would happen to these children. I want to plead with Parliament, I want to plead with you, right honorable Prime Minister, to add as one of our prayers that those 400 children who were sending to school can raise 500 million to allow them to go back to school. I thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Centenary. Honorable Opendi. Opendi. Um, Chaka. Hajat Saida. Nyendoha. Amede. Rakojo. And then we close with the Honorable Moliko. Oh, the Mr. Yes, welcome. Yeah, thank you, Right Honorable Speaker, for giving me an opportunity to take part in eulogizing the life of the late Dr. Cyprian Luanga. Personally, I have had an opportunity to interact with him closely. I remember after the 2016 attack on the King's Palace in Kasese, many of us were traumatized and were not really sure whether we should celebrate the festivities in Kasese. Uh, I briefly went to Kasese, came back to Kampala, and the, the New Year's Day, 1st of January 2017, I had an opportunity to celebrate it at his residence. We even toasted to a glass of wine. I have those fresh memories of him. He counseled me and my wife. He was such a loving spiritual father. And I know that he stood and appreciated the value of humanity. He respected human rights and stood for them. He believed in equity and social justice. And if really we respect our religious leaders, because for me in my culture we have grown up to be, we were taught to respect religious leaders, our fathers, our spiritual fathers. And when they spoke, they spoke on behalf of God. I strongly believe that whatever Dr. Cyprian Luanga advocated for, releasing of the political prisoners, respect for human rights, democracy and good governance, and now that Uganda 
stands on the value of Christianity, hence our motto for God and my country. If we really stand to that value, then we should respect Dr. Cyprian Luanga and practice what he preached in his ministry. Uh, right, Honorable Prime Minister, in my culture, if you don't listen to the elders, you can get nightmares. So <laughs> I am not only sounding a warning, but uh, I am pleading with government to respect, especially the last will that has been talked about of the Archbishop on Good Friday. He's somebody who embraced ecumenism. That is why his last way of the cross, he had his other colleagues from the different uh, denominations. And it was miraculously, it, I, I hadn't seen it before. Opendi? Opendi Chaka? Wajat Saida? Una Unyendoha? Una Bamede? Rakoja Musasisi and then Moriku. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, I want to thank the Right Honorable Prime Minister for the motion, and I do support the motion. I bring condolences from the people of Tororo to the entire Catholic family and to his immediate family too. Right Honorable Speaker, His Grace Cyprian Kizikitolowanga has left a legacy that needs to be emulated by all the religious leaders. We should get away from teaching or, or telling people about miracles, but instead tell people to work. Yes. And this is one of the things that he did preach. He taught people how to save right honorable speaker and therefore complimented government's efforts in the world's creation agenda. He was a developmental person and he spoke, Madam Speaker, quite often against the abuses of human rights. And one of his famous quotes, Madam Speaker, that I want to quote here to Ugandans is that Ugandans should have a duty to promote not division or politics, but unity for this country to develop. And he said the future of Ugandans should be a responsibility of all. We therefore need to know that this is our country, right honorable speaker, and therefore we must all contribute to the peace that we so need to have development. Madam Speaker, the history of Centenary Bank on 4th December, we lost his grace, Archbishop James Odongo, the Archbishop of Bukedi Archdiocese. And at his send, uh, uh, requiem mass that was at Ruvaga, one of the things that I learned was that his grace, Bishop Odongo, was the chairperson of the Episcopal Conference of Uganda. And in 1983, he led the delegation to meet His Excellency then President Obote. And the mission was to ask him to support their program of having this centenary bank. And His Excellency then President Obote, this is what he said, I know you Catholics, when you start something, you cannot fail. Please go ahead and have your bank. And that was his great Madam Speaker. Conclude. That was His Grace Archbishop Odongo and Centenary back then in 1983 was started as a credit trust. And of course later it transitioned in 1993 into a fully fledged bank and His Grace Archbishop um, Cyprian Kizito Luanga contributed towards its growth. Therefore, Right Honorable Speaker, I just wanted to make that clarification but also to say that he has done a lot. One of the things I know that he also spoke against was indecent dressing. People, when they go to church, sometimes you wonder whether they have gone for prayers or for something else. Can we really respect God 
by ensuring that we dress decently when we go in the house of the Lord. May his soul rest in eternal peace. Thank you very much. Honorable Taka. Taka Saida. Nyandoha. Yo, you come. Amede. Then. Uh, Thank you. Right on the And uh, Dr. Moriku. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker, for allowing me to join in paying tribute to our father, the Right Reverend Bishop Cyprian Chistolanga. Right Honorable Speaker and members and government, thank you too for the motion. As Catholics, we are really indebted to you. On third, we woke up to a sad day. Uh, so sadly, it was it is my birthday. I only got the bad news of the demise of our father. Humanly, it was so hurting. But when I reflected on it spiritually, I felt God had taken our father in a very very peaceful way that he didn't make him go through any kind of suffering, despair to his death, and I thank God for that. Right, Honorable Speaker, I want to start from the point of Honorable Sarah Opendi. The motto of the Archbishop, work hard and pray. Many spiritual leaders are taking uh, our people into prayer for days waiting for miracles to happen but here is a spiritual leader who is leading people through the word of god by telling them to work hard and pray whatever you do put it before god for a blessing and then work because nothing is gonna going to come to you when you're just seated Right Honorable Speaker and members, I want to call upon all religious leaders to emulate our father, Dr. Cyprian Chizitoruanga. Let us join in in the struggle to transform our country to improving livelihoods. And I want to request government that in paying to tribute in remembrance of Dr. Cyprian Chizitoruanga, we have set out so many projects, but we have not moved a step. Every time we go out, we still remain one of those poorest countries. Let us settle down and come up with a conclusive program that will take out the multitudes and multitudes of Ugandans out of poverty. So By the state. Thank you. So that everyone can have food to their table, can afford medical care, and can have good shelter. As Catholics, we say, may God grant eternal rest to Dr. Cyprian Storanga and let perpetual light shine upon him. I thank you. Thank you. Honorable Said Abumba followed by Honorable Nyendoha, Abamede, Honorable Rakojo, Honorable Musasizi, and Dr. Moriko. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Right Honorable Speaker. I want to start off by thanking you for a long time to realize the great son of this land. I want to thank government uh, for moving this motion. I stand here to support the motion to pay tribute to the late Archbishop Cyprian Chizito Ruanga. And on behalf of the people of Nakaseke, I bring condolences. Uh, I hear, I'm here to give testimony that uh, his grace the late Archbishop Cyprian Raga was an all-round leader. He was a shepherd to all, 
regardless of creed, religion, tribe, or others. He was developmental. When he was a uh, bishop of Casanaruero, he brought a lot of development to Nakaseke. He came in at a time when we are still, when we are just recovering from the effects of the war. We had shortages of food, people had no income, but through his projects of Twekembe, Caritas, he encouraged people to work. I remember one time we were attending a function with him, and which he was presiding over, and a group of people arrived late. And he, in his sense of humor, he made fun about the people of Nakaseke that they didn't know how to keep time. When it came to my time to speak, I explained to him that those people had traveled over 60, kilo, uh, 60 miles to come and attend the function. I told him that in that large area, we had only three parishes, and I requested him to establish some more parishes so that he takes services to the people. By the time he left Casanaruero, he had established three more parishes. And all these parishes came with development. They came with schools, community centers, health centers, water, and also the general discipline, which goes with uh, ecumenical uh, services when they are brought to the people. One time he visited my farm and he made fun of me. It was uh, during the period of drought, and uh, he had heard that I was uh, propagating cassava. For food security, many of my colleagues know he had the song of uh, Saida Akawa. So he came and I uh, was uh, really, uh, and he was genuine. He said, but uh, how can your farm or you as a leader allow it to be so Feminist Saida, Right Honorable Speaker, his advice was that we should start small scale irrigation. As I conclude, Right Honorable Speaker, uh, the, uh, right, uh, the, His Grace the late promoted unity and diversity. And that's one lesson all of us should take uh, from him. We should not allow petty things to divide us permanently. Let's all promote new unity and diversity. May, the, may his soul rest in eternal peace. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Nyendoha. Nyendoha, I made the uh, Honorable Members. We need to stop somewhere. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity. I want to thank uh, Rugunda for the motion that has been well moved of paying tribute to His Grace, Dr. Sprian Kizitolwanga, Dutch Bishop of Archdiocese of Kampala, and for his dedicated service to the Roman Catholic Church, the Christian family, and the people of Uganda. Bigira Nora Nyendoha, bring condolences from the Pope of Lisa District and the entire Venero subregion. Many have talked about his life and his ministry as a priest, but I want to talk about doctors' last days. The late Archbishop was a dedicated servant of God. He was ordained and set apart for God's purposes because when he accepted to be ordained as a priest in the Catholic Church. That means he allowed himself to be set apart for the service of God. And during that time, he took vows, which vows he kept to the end. And he did not relent in doing this. When you remember on that Good Friday, I was listening to him, I watched him and listened to him. One of his last messages was, and he was calling upon all religious leaders to strengthen the spiritual and moral fiber of the nation so that everybody lives in obedience to God. Me and you, we are leaders in different forms, but the challenge is how are we going to end? What an end to our dear Archbishop. To me, it's a, a time to celebrate his life because he ended well 
in serving his God. I believe that the way the Lord called him was one of the best ways because he died in service. We want to thank God for his life and we pray that the Lord will rest his soul in eternal peace and that we all emulate his good uh, ministry and good example while on earth. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Honorable Amede, then Rakojo, Musasi, and then Dr. Moriko. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker, for the opportunity. And thank you, the Right Honorable Prime Minister, for the motion. On my behalf, and on behalf of the people of Butebo District and the Christians of Tororo Archdiocese, I stand here to pay tribute to the late Archbishop. The Catholic Church is built on the foundations of social justice, human dignity, and solidarity. And those were the core values of the Archbishop. Many have already spoken basing on those values. On my own behalf, I would like to pay tribute to him for promoting inclusive development, for working with the poor. The Twekembe Women's Group is something that he has left standing. He also started a school in his home village and normally when patrons, when managers of such institutions go, they struggle. I therefore pray that government will come to their aid and take them as partners in promoting human development. Let us promote his legacy by promoting politics of peace, politics of respect, and fourth, promote human dignity. I thank you, Honorable Speaker. May he so rest in peace. Thank you, Honorable Rakojo. Rakojo Musasizi, then Honorable Moriko. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity. I would like to thank the Right Honorable Prime Minister for moving this motion and to thank the seconders of the motion. On behalf of the people of Gomba West, I would like to support the motion and to bring sincere condolences to the Catholic community in Uganda. I would like to thank the Archbishop, the late Archbishop, for acting as a link through Bishop Ziwa of Mitiana to the people of Gomba West because they benefited greatly from the Caritas project which he chaired. They got water tanks, uh, water tankers, cows, banana suckers, oranges, pineapples, and coffee seedlings, amongst others. In fact, most of the bananas being consumed now in Madu were got through Caritas. I extend sympathy to Father Erineo Urquago of Madu and to the Catholic community in Gomba West. I thank the late Archbishop for being developmental and for helping women, children, and their families to fight poverty and to remain healthy. May his soul rest in eternal peace. Thank you. Honorable Sasuzi, Sasuden Moriko. Thank you so much, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, I join the rest of the colleagues to pay tribute to the late Archbishop Cyprian Gwanga, and I would like to thank government and the Prime Minister for coming up with this motion. Right Honorable Speaker, I came to know the late Archbishop Cyprian Gwanga when I got 
my first job at Caritas. That time, he was the president of Caritas in Uganda, and he was the bishop of Luero Archdiocese. I later came to interact with him more when I came to Parliament in 2011, when he invited us for a dinner. I would like to appreciate him for a number of things. One, at the dinner, he encouraged us to remain united and legislate with the Christian lenses in our eyes. The late Bishop, Archbishop Cyprian Gwanga made a significant contribution to grow Centenary Bank to where it is now. He spent over 17 years serving in the board of Centenary Bank. The late Archbishop Cyprian Gwanga established a number of projects in Kampala Archdiocese, Ruero Archdiocese where he first worked, and a number of projects have been benchmarked by other dioceses, especially Kavali Diocese, where I come from. Therefore, Madam Speaker, on behalf of the people of Rwanda, whom I represent, and on behalf of the people of Kavali Diocese, we want to extend our heartfelt condolences to the demise of the late Archbishop Cyprian Gwanga. We will remember him for his contribution. What we can say now is that may God grant him eternal rest. Thank you, Your Right Honorable Speaker. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Can I invite Dr. Maurice? Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. I stand to support the motion to pay tribute to the late Archbishop Cyprian Kizito Luanga by the Right Honorable Prime Minister and supported seconders. I want to thank you all. Madam Speaker, I want to thank you in a special way for the time you have allocated to enable that people give contributions and tribute to the late bishop. He, indeed, he deserves this lengthy of time. Madam Speaker, the Bible says, let your light shine before men so that they, do the good, they see the good work that you do and give glory to your heavenly Father. And indeed, today, we are here to pay tribute. We are here to glorify God for the life that he has given to our beloved late Archbishop. Just one legacy that I want to remember him with, the legacy he left in social services which affects directly the lives of the people. Madam Speaker, Kampala Archdiocese Health Department started in 1972 just as one of those departments of the lay apostolate. But under his leadership, Currently, there are over 25 health facilities with four hospitals, including Nsambia, Robaga, Kisubi, and Nkosi Hospital. We really thank him for this contribution in the health sector. He took, the Archbishop took the vows of obedience. And Madam Speaker, indeed, he lived to his vows. At the onset of COVID last year, when he recalled the moment when the churches are to close up, the time when the church are not supposed to open the doors for Christians to worship, that was a very difficult moment and decision for the government. I recall when H.E. called the leaders of the church, Archbishop was one of the very obedient shepherds and the leaders to say, yes, I value the life of the people, we are not going to open the church for the people to come on Sundays. And we really thank him for being exemplary and closing the church during that time for valuing the life of the Christians. Madam Speaker, 
The right honorable prime minister has put it right here to us that what took the life of our dear beloved Archbishop was ischemic heart disease due to coronary artery thrombosis. Indeed, Madam Speaker, this arises due to the narrowing of the coronary the coronary arteries. These are two in number, Madam Speaker. These are the arteries that supplies the heart muscles and the component of the heart. And these are the arteries, once they become narrow, the blood supply to the heart, the nutrient to the heart, oxygen supply to the heart will not be there. And eventually, the heart muscles and the entire component of the heart dies off, becomes necrosis, becomes ischemic. And this has taken some time, Madam Speaker. Since 2015, I want to thank the Catholic Church of Kampala Archdiocese at this point in time for the care and the love they have offered the Archbishop to ensure that coronary angioplasty and stand placement was done in India, to ensure that the health of the Archbishop was taken care of by the church. And the church did not stop there. In 2017, again, they make sure when the Archbishop made another journey to India, the church was there, the Catholic Archdiocese of Kampala, to take care of the Archbishop, to offer the best quality medical services so that that coronary artery is kept open and the Archbishop remains serving his flock. At this point in time, Madam Speaker, many of us will ask ourselves as health fraternity, what is it that we have not done? to save the life of our Archbishop. Once the coronary artery becomes narrow and narrow and narrow, it blocks. There is going to be formation of plaques, formation of clot, and other substance, which occludes the blood supply to the heart muscles. And precisely, that is what took the life of our dear Archbishop. And because of the formation of the plaque, the clot, which blocked the left coronary artery, eventually he had that sudden heart attack that led to his death. At this point in time, allow me really to appreciate the Catholic Archdiocese for the care they have offered for the Archbishop. I want to appreciate Rubaga Hospital. I want to appreciate Nakasero Hospital. I want to appreciate Men Medanda Hospital in India, and I want to thank Apollo International Hospital in India. All those hospitals and the healthcare workers that have really offered quality care to our Archbishop to ensure that all this time he was in position to look after himself. Lastly, Madam Speaker, as I conclude, as we pay tribute to his legacy, we are also learning lots of lessons to take home. In Uganda, 24.3% of people from studies that have been done, they have got high blood pressure. Out of the 24.3, 76.1 do not know that they have high blood pressure. And it is on that note that the death of the Archbishop should give us a really lesson and everybody should rise up to speak about non-communicable diseases, our lifestyle diseases, the diet that we eat, the exercise that we do to keep fit, our habit of taking alcohol and smoking cigarettes and the stress of eventful life that we go all through. So I want to appeal to the people of Uganda as we continue to pay tribute to our beloved dear Archbishop, let's learn lesson and see that he has looked after his health. We too, we should take this opportunity to take responsibility of our health. And finally, the social media, Madam Speaker, we are appealing to the social media, health matters are private matters between me and my family. So when there is no official communication from recognized institution, the media could spare 
these rumors that causes a lot of friction, causes a lot of tension, and that is precisely what has happened. I want to thank you. May his soul continue to rest in peace and his light continue to shine so that men see the good work he has done and give glory to our heavenly Father. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moriku. Right now, Prime Minister and other members, our plan had been to spend one hour on this tribute, but uh, it became very clear that you cannot pay tribute to Dr. Jistoroanga in one hour. You heard about the lives he touched, the people he gave jobs, the communities he transformed, the water, the health, the schools. So we have overshot our time, but 20, 35 members have been able to pay tribute to the Archbishop. I want to invite the Prime Minister if you have some closing remarks to say them before we close. Uh, thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Just a few remarks. One is to thank you and colleagues for spending this quality time paying tribute to our foreign top religious leader and indeed patriot. So this has been very, very befitting. Number two, many colleagues have raised issues which he himself raised a number of times about people who are in prison. Government is doing everything possible to ensure that the legal process it, Yes, that is the fact. Government is doing everything possible to see that courts of law do their work and if there are gaps, government will endeavor to ensure that those gaps are filled so that courts of law do their work. Thirdly, the issue of ecumenism has been stressed and really I wanted to say this foreign hero of ours was a great preacher. It happened that uh, his last day he talked about a number of things. I happened to be on the television and for the first time I had somebody talking of I may not be a very informed person but he was one who was talking of five wounds that uh, Jesus Christ had and uh, that information was given to him by him in such a strong way that it had impact on some of us. He also explained the cross that the Catholic community uh, make and the meaning of it. This was on television. So he was somebody who believed in explaining and giving clear messages. And in the humanism, this was his last symbol. Him and the Bishop Kazimba, the Archbishop of the Church of Uganda, together with their followers moving in the way of the cross. So really, he demonstrated the unity and ecumenism. I must agree with the colleagues the fact that the president of Uganda announced and gave official burial to our foreign archbishop was a very significant recognition that government attaches to his contribution to the country. The last comment that I want to make is what has been said about the children that he was supporting. This is a matter that will be looked at closely by Minister of Education and the Government because we don't want any Ugandan child uh, to miss going to school. So this is a matter that will be followed. So in conclusion, I want to thank colleagues I want to thank all those who played different roles in the send of ceremony. Minister uh, 
Muyingo was in Chabakade. Uh, His Excellency, the Vice President, was uh, in the last day of send off in Rubaga. Uh, the Minister of ICT was also at Rubaga. And I must say, our sister Nakiwala played special roles because of special closeness and the relationship with the Archbishop and we are really grateful for all this devotion, love and the patriotic responsibilities that you colleagues uh, did play. He has departed but he has left Uganda more united because of what because of what he was doing and because Ugandans closed their ranks and forgot their political lines and all united to say bye to him. May once again his soul rest in eternal peace. Thank you. Uh, Prime Minister, I'm just seeking clarification. In view of your concluding remarks, how do we now move the issue of the children to the government? Can uh, we ask them to submit a list to the government? That's a, a fair point by the right of speaker. The, the names should be submitted to the Minister of Education with the copies, with the copies to His Excellency the President and to the Prime Minister. We work as a coordinated government and then government will consider rationally what is the appropriate action to, that should be taken to ensure that these young people do not miss on their education. Thank you very much, Honourable Members. There was also another matter members wanted to add, but I realized it was in the breach of Article 93. That's why I've now shifted to the Prime Minister. The, uh, concerning the political prisoners, tomorrow I have received notice that the Minister of Internal Affairs is coming to so that issue tomorrow, so we shall take it up uh, at that stage. But in the meantime, I want to put the question that the question be put. Those in favor say aye, the contrary no. And I put the question that this house do pay tribute to the late Cyprian, Dr. Cyprian Kizitorwanga, Archbishop of uh, Kampala Diocese. Those in favor say aye, the contrary no. I have it now. The clerk is instructed to make two tributes, two sets of tribute, together with the hazards of today. One set to be sent to the Archdiocese of Kampala, the second set to be sent to the family of our deceased friend. Thank you. Statement by Minister. Statement on the signing of key agreements for the oil and gas sector. Honorable Dr. Kitutu. Hey, I see the ministers moving. What's happening? Ah, no, 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 you guys. Please. You are walking out because your business is finished? Uh, right honorable speaker and honorable colleagues on sunday 11th april 2021 uganda witnessed a historic milestone in its journey to fast oil which marked the launch of uganda's oil and gas projects the event, which culminated into the conclusion of the key agreements, was graced by the two heads of state, His Excellency President Yoweri Kagutam Seven and High Excellency Samia Suluhu Hassan, the President of the United Republic of Tanzania. One of the key agreements signed was the Uganda Host Agreement, Host Government Agreement, which is abbreviated HGA between the government of Uganda and the East African Crude Oil Pipeline Company. It was an, an honor for me to sign on behalf of government of the 
Republic of Uganda. Mr. Martin Tiffen, the general manager of the East African Crude Oil Pipeline Company, signed the Uganda HGA on behalf of the company. The HGA concluded the legal framework and contractual obligations between Uganda as the host country and the East African Crude Oil Pipeline Company as the project company. The second agreement was the Shareholders Agreement, abbreviated as SHA. The Shareholders Agreement defines the rights and responsibilities of the shareholders in the ECOP company. The shareholders are the Uganda National Oil Company, UNOC, with 15%, the joint venture partners, that is Total EP Uganda Limited, with 62%, and Sinok Uganda Limited with 8%, and the Tanzanian Petroleum Development Corporation, TPDC. TPDC will take shareholding of up to 15%. The SHA is significant because it has constituted the ECOP company and will now guide the funding of the shareholding, finance structure, and general governance of the company. The third agreement that was signed is the Tariff and Transportation Agreement, abbreviated as TTA. The TTA defines the rights and responsibilities of the shippers on one hand and the transporter on the other hand. The TTA was signed between the transporter, that is the ECOP company, and the shippers of the crude oil, who are the government of Uganda, UNOC, Total E&P Uganda Limited and Sinok Uganda Limited. Right on our speaker, the launch of the projects on Sunday paved way for ECOP company to award the main engineering procurement and construction contracts. The award of these contracts is important because it opens up substantial opportunities for Ugandans and Ugandan companies to provide goods and services for the construction of the ECOP. The conclusion of these key agreements for the ECOP, right on our speaker, is a major requirement for the announcement of the final investment decision, abbreviated FID. It is important to appreciate that there is no document that will be signed for or called FID. The project launch on Sunday 11th April 2021 at State House Entebbe is a demonstration of the commitment the respective governments and oil companies have for the projects. With these agreements in place, the oil companies and government can proceed with the approval and award of the contracts in the main engineering procurement and construction contractors. This will enable the construction work for the project to proceed. Government and companies estimate that fast oil will be within four years, with the actual construction starting this year. However, other processes are already ongoing, including the acquisition of land for the pipeline and the EPC management activities. It is important for the people of Uganda to take note of and position themselves to benefit from the extensive activities already going on. The Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development developed the local content policy in 2018 to streamline the implementation of the national content regulations within the petroleum laws. There are also ongoing opportunities by the government and the joint venture partners for skills development, specialized training, and enterprise development, all aimed at building the capacity of Ugandans and Ugandan companies to competitively work in or supply goods and services to the sector. Right on our speaker, it is a requirement for all companies that would like to supply goods and services in Uganda's oil and gas industry to register on the National Supplier Database through the Petroleum Authority of Uganda website. Similarly, Ugandans who would like to work in the sector I encourage to get on to the National Oil and Gas Talent Register for easy access and visibility of the jobs in the sector. 
the signing of the agreements and the launch of the oil and gas projects, more so during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, are an assurance of commitment from our investment partners towards the sustainable development of Uganda's petroleum resources. Uganda's oil and gas project is the only major project in sub-Saharan Africa to be sanctioned since the pandemic started, with at which attests to the profitability of the projects and the country as a favorable investment destination. The significant investment into Uganda's economy that has now been unlocked includes the implementation of the Tilenga project in Ulisa and Noya districts. And this, cost, this will cost approximately four billion U.S. dollars. The Kingfisher project in Hoima and Chikube districts will cost approximately, approximately 1.5 billion U.S. dollars. The East African crude oil pipeline will cost. It will cross the ten districts of Hoima, Chikube, Kakumiro, Changwanzi, Gomba. Mubende, Ruengo, Sembamule, Chotera, and Arakai in Uganda, and it will approximately cost 3.6 billion US dollars. This is in addition to what government is already investing in the required support infrastructure. That includes Hoima International Airport, which is costing government over 500 million US dollars, and also 700 kilometers of oil roads which are costing around 900 million US dollars. Some of the specific benefits that will accrue to Ugandans and Ugandans and Ugandan companies from the launch of the pro projects include the following. De-risking all the other upcoming projects, including the refinery and the new exploration projects. The development of the upstream projects guarantees the supply of feed stock into the refinery, while the pipeline and the refinery provide evacuation options for future oil discoveries in the new exploration areas. Employment of Ugandans. This will be through direct employment of about 14,000 people by the companies. Indirect employment will be about 45,000 people by the contractors and the induced employment of about 105,000 people as a result of utilization of other services by the old oil and gas sector. Of the direct employment, 57% are expected to be Ugandans, which is expected to result in an estimated income of US dollar 48.5 million annually, and this will be paid to Ugandan employees. Participation of Ugandan enterprises in the provision of goods and services. At least 28% of the US dollar 15 billion, that is equivalent to 4.2 billion investment during the development and construction will go to Ugandan companies through provision of various goods and services and works. Currently contracts worth US dollar 167 million out of the US dollar 1.362 billion recommendations to award for the Tilenga and Kingfisher projects that have been presented to the Petroleum Authority of Uganda before FID are to be awarded directly to Ugandan companies. This only accounts for 19 out of over 30 work packages to be awarded by the licensees. However, it is important to note that there will be many more subcontracts given to Ugandan companies through subcontracting by the level one contractors. Capacity building and technology transfer through subcontracting and joint venturing. With the involvement of the world-class oil service companies and the expected joint venture and subcontracting opportunities, Ugandan companies are expected to greatly benefit from the expected partnerships. As witnessed during the exploration phase, we expect Ugandan companies to progressively gain capabilities to provide technical services that have been hitherto been a preserve of more experienced foreign companies. And in addition, the GDP of the country expected to reach 
US dollar 40 billion in 2020 2021 will be significantly be boosted through sector linkages by close to US dollar 9 billion that is an increase of 22% by the end of the construction phase in conclusion right on the speaker the oil agreements co I mean conclusion of the oil agreements is a key milestone for the country Government of Uganda commits to ensuring that processes leading to fast oil bring enhanced value for the country while maintaining a good return on investment for the investors. I beg to move. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Honor Minister. Honor members, this was really just for information because we were not present at the signing. So the minister offered just to update us on uh, where we are. But I think we shall ask our committee on natural resources to follow up the contents and uh, update parliament further. Is that okay, members? Yes, national dialogue. <laughs> Thank you so much, Honorable Speaker. And, uh, the minister, Dr. Gidudu, for bringing parliament and the country to up to date. Honorable Speaker, through you last week, I laid on table here the matrix you helped us generate with the Minister of Energy itself, how to fast track the fast oil in a multi-sectoral um, Interministerial, interagency coordinated way. We are in the budget process, Honorable Speaker, and I have been following this matrix which I laid on the table. We are looking at the ministerial policy statements of different entities. It seemed as if at the beginning only PAO and the UNOC was being looked at. But when you see that matrix and when you see the interministerial way, there are so many sectors which up to now have not been brought to date. I would request, as the Committee of Natural Resources uh, digests uh, details of this uh, statement from the Minister, the Minister could go ahead, Minister of Energy as the lead minister in oil and gas, working with the Minister of Finance, which is in charge of the wallet, they should really give us a commitment in as far as making the dream of the first oil real. If 2025 is now believed to be the Rio have expected uh, to manage expectation, then we should equally finance other government agencies because the PSA model is giving the oil companies leverage, and for them they are now pushing for that uh, for that uh, Tanga pipeline. But remember, for us as a country, the, we have Parliament has to give money. To counterpart funding to all the agencies. If we don't, the cost of this oil could become higher and therefore rendering our profits very little. But most important, Honorable Speaker, I would also want, while they are reporting on the commitment of funding the, the sector, would want the refinery, which is going to be the most important benefit to, 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 to East Africa. Value addition should also get a report. Because we got reports, uh, uh, Honorable Speaker, that the consortium led American company, we are about to repeat the Etau, the Etau fiasco of, of Katosi Road. That that company is a commission agent, so the earlier ones were much more serious, so we need also to be informed that that will be uh, done. Finally, that was speaker last week, I was in Hoima International Airport, and found out the land we helped so much to acquire is empty and idle. Can the Minister of Energy, working, you know, working with trade and industry, work on that important Hoima International Industrial Park? No road, no water, no electricity, and we shouldn't give it to a PPP because it's such a viable project for Uganda. It's where we're going to get value addition. It's where we are going to change the, uh, the opportunities and use that international airport. So those matters, I would request the Minister bring a comprehensive report uh, so that uh, we can be manage expectations of this country, but also I want to thank her for the report 
but the communication source, the regional speaker you processed in this parliament, I think they had gone quiet because they weren't sure. Now that the president has signed, can we see a more robust communication strategy so that citizens don't keep asking questions to parliament when they don't know what's happening? I thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad the minister is here. She will uh, respond at uh, uh, the appropriate time. But since we still have the energy people, let's go to item nine for two minutes and then return to item four. Item, I'll try item five. The item number nine. Uh, response by Minister to urgent questions. Nine one. Honorable Minister of State for Minerals. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, this was um, uh, a question raised by the Honorable Bukenya regarding the eviction of over 30,000 at Sano Miners from Kisita Mining Site. Madam Speaker, this is not the first time that I am responding to this matter. It was raised in March and yet I had just responded to the same from a member of parliament from the same district, Honorable Nsamba Patrick. Madam Speaker, allow me to inform this house that Kisita Mining Company was granted a mining lease for 21 years, and that was uh, in August 2002. In 2015, Horizon Energy acquired 56% interest in Kisita Mining Company, and thereafter, the were management wrangles, Madam Speaker, and between the two minority shareholders and the majority shareholder, and these two groups resolved their differences and a consent agreement was arrived at on 16th January 2020. But during this time, when these companies had their management wrangles, some people went and took over the mining area. Madam Speaker, I personally, in March 2020, working with the anti-corruption team, because His Excellency the President had asked them to handle this matter, when the majority shareholder flew into the country from Abu Dhabi, we worked with Uganda Revenue Authority that initially wanted to auction the property we all went to Kisita, and in the, the presence of the people who found at the site, we asked them to leave. Madam Speaker, they requested for do two, only two days so that they wind up and leave. And these people left. To our surprise, Madam Speaker, when there was a lockdown, I was then informed that the Police Minerals Protection Unit in connivance with some illegal miners had gone back and were mining quietly. And this was reported to me by the chairman LC5 of Cassandra. When we went, uh, there was another site where people had died. Madam Speaker, from then, more illegal miners. Imagine they were just, I found one with 100 people and asked them to leave. That gentleman we found at the site um, was arrested and even charged in court. But Madam Speaker, instead of the police now protecting the mining site, they opened up and all kinds of people, over 70 illegal heads, their heads employing these 30,000 people are at the site. Madam Speaker, His Excellency the President also picked interest and quietly investigated this matter on 4th of, 4th of August. 2020, he convened a meeting between the IGP, myself, the deputy IGP, and said his findings had shown that the Police Minerals Protection Unit were not doing the work that they were required to do and have instead encouraged illegal mining. Following that, Madam Speaker, His Excellency the President wrote a strong letter to us, addressed to me and to the IGP to have these illegal miners evicted so that they don't continue depleting a resource that was given to Horizon, I mean to Kisita Mining Company. Madam Speaker, it is like having Mukwano there 
properly licensed to operate and people go and take over and Mukwano is out crying and government is looking on. So Madam Speaker, I want to appeal to this parliament to support us to ensure that we end this business of people using um, some security organs to take over the minds of other people. It takes a lot of money for somebody to commence mining because for seven years you are just doing exploration and a lot of money is put in, sunk in. This gentleman came to this country, one thing he told me, Madam Speaker, this majority shareholder, that you have a beautiful country. Your president has been inviting us to come and invest, but you have crooks in this country. Because his manager was arrested for nothing and locked up in the cells. And when he was released, he left. He then, Madam Speaker, some friends got to know this Mr. Mustafa and appointed him as his manager now. Now you can hear Mr. Mustafa is a fugitive, is what the police knows that if the police knows that he's a fugitive, why haven't they arrested him? We as a sector cannot involve ourselves in those matters and I want to state, Madam Speaker, that Mr. Mustafa is not a shareholder. This Turkish man they keep talking about is not a shareholder in Kisita Mining Company. Kisita Mining Company is owned majority by majority shareholder Horizon who are from Abu Dhabi and of course the other shareholder who sold was the Ugandan, the Mawanda family because they could not, um, uh, they did not have resources to procure necessary equipment to get into really real gold mining. So they sold their shares and brought these people on board. However, ever since then, these people have not been helped even when the president has directed Madam Speaker we are, I don't have a force, and I hope, right honorable Prime Minister, that we can resolve this matter. It is only in this country where the President can give a directive, and the people dilly dally around the directive. So, Madam Speaker, I want to request that this Parliament supports us to get rid of these mafias from the mines. Otherwise, we are going to discourage investments in this sector, because once somebody has done exploration and found his gold, then others come and jump on board. And I also want to state, Madam Speaker, that these people, the 35,000 people that we are talking about, that we should find a livelihood for, are working for mafias. We want them to work for the owners of the company. And this is why we should get them out and let the owners of the company recruit them because actually they were working for them even before. And when I met them, they actually had no problem. They said, for us, all we need is to work. So once we have order, they will definitely be working under the owners of the company. And I also want to state, Madam Speaker, to clear the air here that where this mining site is, it is land for the National Forest Authority. It is not a place like others where there were settlers and people are claiming for compensation or something like that. So we are just left with two years for the lease to expire, Madam Speaker. But these people have not benefited from their investments. You can imagine this gentleman put in eight million dollars into the mines. He procured equipment when you go there. There is equipment, there is everything, but he has failed to actually do his work. So, Madam Speaker, with those remarks, I want to conclude. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Madam Minister. No, but there's no more debate on that issue. It was answered. This is now the second time. Yes, Chair of Natural Resources. Madam Speaker, I just want to make some clarifications on this. I think, uh, first of all, this is uh, a classic case of the problems we have in the mining law, where the somebody is given a big swath of land to do mining and then they absentee themselves and then the local people stay they do the the mining and then they get the gold and when they discover when out the, the, the person owning the mining license discovered that actually things are working out very well there then they come in and then they threaten to evict the people who are uh, who are mining and then they call them illegal miners now, 
there is a, a conflict between the people there who are owning the land. Although the minister is saying that it's the land of National Forest Authority. Part of it might be, but the large swath of it, some of it is privately owned by the people there. But, but they don't have the mining license. Point of order. Point of order. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, when I go to this ministry, the first complaint that I found handed over to me by Honorable Keris was on this company because I go to the ministry in January 2020. The consent agreement between the majority and minority shareholders was arrived at on the 16th of January. Madam Speaker, the conflict in Kisita was a management one and it had nothing to do with the people. It is now that some people are trying to come up and claim that they have been mining there. We all know the story about Kisita, Ma Madam Speaker. There is nothing like there were people mining there. It was just a conflict amongst the management and the Police Minerals Protection Unit actually became a problem also at this site because some of them became beneficiaries of what was going on at this place. So it is not true that there are land conflicts regarding this site. There are land conflicts regarding another mining site close by, but not this particular one, Madam Speaker. Thank you, right? Is it in order, therefore, for the chairman to tell lies to this house that they have managed land conflicts when we don't have any known by us as the ministry that is supposed to be supervising these people? Ah, now, other members, you know, the Mubende area, Kasanda, all these are mining areas, so maybe there, there are several conflicts. But let us not go into it today, please. But also, is the Honorable Minister in order to use unparliamentary language that I'm lying? Uh, but, but, but anyway, Madam Speaker, just to clarify, it's not a, a question of land conflict. It's a land of conflict between the artisanal miners and those who have been licensed to do the mining there. Okay, that's one problem on one hand. The other problem is that we have 35,000 people now doing the mining there. Now, of course, the, the owner has the mining license, and those who are mining there now, yes, are mining illegally. But how do we proceed? Do, does the, and by the way, I've looked at the letter of the president. The president's letter does not say that they should be evicted forcefully. Actually, it says they should try and find an amicable way of how they can be made to live. So, what I think we have to do is to find an amicable way of how this process can be processed in order to reach a good understanding of how... Now, on our members, I think... But I wonder why the minister is so agitated about this. You, you know, don't have members, vested interest in this. On our, members, are, on our members, let us go to item four, please. Let's go to item four. Item number four. Motion for reconsideration of the public procurement and disposal of assets amendment bill 2020 as returned by his excellency the president in accordance with article 93, sorry, 913B of the constitution. Members yesterday received a comprehensive report on the PPDA amendment uh, as returned by his excellency the president. We invited members to go and study the report, in particular the proposals for amendment and we'll be concluding it today. So are there any, any comments? Yes, on about gone. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Uh, this bill was returned, I think, on 9th of July, 2020. And therefore, we don't need to delay it. One, Madam Speaker, I have tried personally to go through this bill, and you find that 
It is a very technical bill to deal with, that is one. Two, most of the issues raised are speaking to issues of uh, avoiding lacunas in the law. There is an issue of omission. There is another of effective operation, specifically about the tribunal. And then uh, interpretation and application. And when you read through, right on the speaker, I do not see the need for us to have a prolonged debate over this returned bill. One, there was an issue raised by the president on the issue of renaming the PPDA. And he raises a concern that if you are not providing for the successor entity, how are you going to deal with the issues of liabilities and obligations? Because I think there was an omission there. We didn't provide for that. So I do not see anything that needs a lot of debate on that. Because indeed, we must provide for succession. And I think the president did go into details. He should have even inclu included their assets. Whenever you, as an accountant, I think Honorable Chair of the committee knows, whenever you talk about liabilities, remember to talk about assets. When you talk about assets, also remember to talk about liabilities. So assets and liabilities, obligations, pending contracts, contracts which have been signed, if you forget to talk about them, if you do not provide for succession, who will manage? You run away, you change your name, you are now a new entity, who is going to manage your debts? What about the existing agreements? So I think the president has raised a valid point here, which does not really attract further questioning, in my opinion. The issue number two is the issue of omission to repeal section 90, which is to him similar to 89 and may cause contradictions. And this one is immediately dealing with issues of administrative reviews. And I think we don't need to debate over that. Madam Speaker, amendment of part 7A of the Act is basically dealing with the issues of effective operation of the tribunal. And I believe, and I want to think, our committee did proper surgery. They did their job. And it will not be good for us to do spontaneous work on the floor. I think what the, the, the committee has done is that enough. This bill is technical. If we allow for any spontaneous action here, it can easily get derailed and operation of the bill, enforcement of the bill, implementation will be made hard. And yet you know the whole country is waiting for these amendments. This is what saves us from all the quagmire that we have been having. And therefore, Madam Speaker, without wasting time, unless there is a colleague who feels he has a very pertinent issue to raise over these returned amendments, I would suggest, if your guide is so, we will proceed straight away to committee stage so that we save on this. We have a lot of backlog, Madam Speaker, including the tax bills which are coming from tomorrow. But I want, before I sit down, to applaud the Committee on Finance, but also specifically the Chair. Madam Speaker, whenever you have some privileges for your hardworking members, try to consider those who work. There are people who have sacrificed their families, they have sacrificed their everything, they don't go on holidays, whereas other people are enjoying, they are working day and night. Hey, they are working like medical staff during lockdown. And yet there is nothing forthcoming for them. When there is an opportunity, please consider them. These people have worked. Honorable Bahati there, Honorable Musashi, and the committee. I salute you. Madam Speaker, you, if you agree, let's proceed to committee stage. I thank you. Okay, honour members, if there are no other comments, I put the question that the Public Procurement and Disposal of Assets Amendment 2020 be read for the second time. Those in favour say aye, the contrary no. I serve it. Bill's committee stage.